title for the message this morning is Prepared for the Worst. Um, and, we'll, and our text will be the whole of Daniel, Daniel chapter 8. But let us pray um, as we, we come to God's Word this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for you know, the privilege of knowing you and to be part of your people who once had not received mercy but now have received mercy. To be those who've caught out of darkness into light. Um, to declare your praises, to show that we have truth, that we have life, um, yes, that we have hope, O oh God. Yeah, we thank you for so much that is, that is ours already, even as your word said, every spiritual blessing in Christ. And, and so we thank you for the word of God that we have, that we can know and understand and delight more in this riches of grace and the glory of salvation. Um, that is ours, and that much more be able to glory in Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Help us to do that then. Help us to continue to worship Him as we hear Your Word now. In Jesus' name, Amen. <clears throat> so it's true in life that we are forever preparing for things, sometimes good things, sometimes bad things. Um, for example, we enjoy preparing for a holiday. Perhaps if it's a bit of a road trip, planning the routes, packing your bags, um, getting the putt course ready, the growing anticipation for going on a holiday, or perhaps preparing for a wedding, um, as Neil and Anna have had over the last couple of months, and preparing for Nicole's wedding last night or yesterday. Um, sure, the venue, the flowers, the food, the guests, the table sitting, um, it's exciting stuff. Moments of stress, but nonetheless, what a great thing to prepare for a wedding. For those of you into sports, preparing for a big sport event, or the training, or the nutrition, and eating, and diet, um, the resting. Um, yeah, so much of life is involved preparing. Um, but sometimes that preparation is for things that maybe are slightly less enjoyable. The matrix here have been busy preparing the last couple of weeks for their mock or, or trial exams, stuck at a desk, less social time, less fun time, hard work. I mean, no hands up for those who enjoy preparing for exams, right? You are all preparing for an operation, um, like Anneli with her knee replacement in a couple of months, and you can't eat and you can't drink and you've got to clear your calendar and you've got to arrange leave and you've got to get a lift to the hospital. Um, yeah, preparing for an operation is sometimes quite an orde ordeal. But surely one of the worst things is when a loved one has a terminal illness and you are preparing for death. when the end is, is near and it's many doctor's appointments, slowly seeing the person become less able, eating less, moving less. Yeah, it's never a, a, an easy thing to prepare for the worst when someone is about to die. And so life is full of preparation, some good, some bad. And today as Christians, we are reminded how we need to be preparing our lives, our spiritual lives, because of the evil world that we live in. That yes, as Christians, we have much to rejoice in. There's much that is good for us. But oh, this is not our home. And so we at times need to be prepared prepared even for the worst because of the nature of sin and evil in our world. That, that as Christians, and I wonder if we are really, need to be prepared for hardship and prepared for loss and prepared for sacrifice, prepared for persecution, prepared even for such death. That's certainly the perspective that Daniel 8 here offers us this morning. The need to be prepared even for the worst. That perhaps we should be preparing our lives in anticipation of things getting harder 
Instead of always expecting, which we seem to do, that things are going to get easier. Or wishing that things were, were easier. That, that today we challenge that we, we need to con- consider keeping our lives spiritually robust. Because we do not know what's going to come around the next corner. We do not know what the future exactly is going to hold. But we're able to to live like that. We're able to live prepared for the worst because we know, as we're going to see, what Jesus has done for us means we already have the best. So whatever comes at us now that may be the worst, we can endure because of Jesus as we daily prepare and lean on Him. So let's read Daniel chapter 8, prepared for the worst. Again, as I've had to say most times, the message today is longer because of the scripture reading that's at least six or seven minutes in the sermon. So do brace yourself for that. So in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me. So again, chronologically, this is back in time from chapter 6, which ended under the reign of King Darius and the Persians. This is still when the people of Israel in exile are under Babylonian oppression and domination. Although this is now very near the end, in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, whose reign we saw came to a swift end in the writing of the wall as he chose to use the temple vessels for his debauched party. But nonetheless, this is a couple of years on from chapter 7, which we looked at last week, just to place that, if that's helpful, a time peg. That's what the writer is reminding us here, where we are. So this vision appeared to Daniel then, um, after the one which had appeared to him first, chapter 7. And I saw in the vision, and and when I saw, uh, I was in Susa, the, the capital of Persia, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in the vision, and I saw at, and, and, and I, oh, sorry, and, and, I, and I saw in the vision, and I was at Uli Canal. I raised my eyes and saw, and behold, a, a ram standing on the bank of the canal. It had two horns, and both horns were high, but one was higher than the other. And the higher one came up last. And I saw the ram charging westward and northward and southward. And no beast could stand before him. And there was no one who could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. And as I was considering, behold, a male goat came from the west across the face of the whole earth without touching the ground. And the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. And he came to the ram with the two horns which I had seen standing on the bank of the canal, and he ran at him in his powerful wrath. And I saw him come close to the ram, and he was enraged against him, and struck the ram, and broke his two horns. And the ram had no power to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled on him, and there was no one who could rescue the ram from the goat's power. And then the goat became exceedingly great. But when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and instead of it, there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. Then, out of one of them, these four horns, came another little horn, which grew exceedingly great towards the south, towards the east, and towards the glorious land. It grew great even to the host of heaven. And some of the host and some of the stars it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. It became great, even as great as the prince of the host. And the regular burnt offering was taken away from him, and the place of his sanctuary was overthrown. And a host will be given over to it together with the regular burnt offerings because of transgression. And it will throw truth to the ground, and it will act and prosper. And then I heard a holy one speaking, and and another holy one said to the one who spoke, For how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering? 
the transgression that makes desolate and the giving over of the sanctuary and host to be trampled underfoot. And he said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, and then the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful state. When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. And behold, there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, and it called, and it called, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. And so he came near where I stood. And when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, understand, O son of man, that the vision is for the time of the end. And when he had spoken to me, I fell into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. But he touched me and made me stand up. And he said, Behold, I will make known to you what shall be at the latter end of the indignation. For it refers to the appointed time of the end. As for the ram that you saw with the two horns, these are the kings of Media and Persia. And the goat is the king of Greece. And the great horn between his eyes is the first king. And as for the horn that was broken, in place of which four others arose, four kingdoms shall arise from his nation, but not with his power. And at the latter end of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their limit, a king of bold face, one who understands riddles, shall arise. And his power shall be great but not by his own power, and he shall cause fearful destruction and shall succeed in what he does and destroy mighty men and people who are the saints. By his cunning he shall make deceit prosper under his hand, and in his own mind he shall become great. Without warning he shall destroy many, and he shall even rise up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken, but by no human hand. And the vision of the evenings and the mornings it has been told is true. But seal up the vision, for it refers to many days from now. And I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for some days. And then I rose and went about the king's business, but I was appalled by the vision and did not understand it. So, each chapter in, in Daniel, particularly from Daniel 7, gets more and more difficult. As you would have appreciated having read that chapter, So let's see how we can firstly understand, although we are helped greatly with this by the angel's interpretation, understand this vision and then apply that to what it means for how we can, from day to day, be living lives that are well prepared even for the worst. Because that's at the heart of this whole vision, is Daniel sees that something terrible is lying in the future for his people and for Jerusalem and for the temple. That somehow, someone is going to come and cause great devastation. And you can realize that that was traumatic for Daniel, even as he expresses at the end of this vision in the last verse, where he is overcome, where he lies sick for days. Um, where even though Daniel, who you remember was the one who was the great dream interpreter for Nebuchadnezzar, etc., who was gifted by God to understand others' dreams, here has his own vision, which for one he cannot interpret himself, but he is given a clear interpretation by the angel Gabriel, but yet still concludes that he is appalled by the vision and did not understand it. Well, of course, because 
he was living a number of centuries before this vision was fulfilled, but more so because he was appalled at the thought that here God's people are coming toward the end of their 70-year exile, right? Remember, that's where they are. And so surely he is thinking we've suffered enough. Surely that's it. And we're going to go back to the land and go back to Jerusalem and continue to live a life as God had promised and a life of worship. But what has he told you? He's told no. In fact, things are going to get worse. Are you with me? So now this vision parallels likely the vision of chapter 6, I mean of chapter 7 of the four beasts we saw last week, which too has a parallel even to the vision of Nebuchadnezzar that he had of the statue, where in different ways God is revealing to Babylon and now to more so to his people that there are going to be successive worldly kingdoms that are going to come. Kingdoms of great power, kingdoms of great might. As we saw in the revelation of the statue to Nebuchadnezzar that the angel told, that, uh, Daniel was told that the head of gold was, was Babylon, was King Nebuchadnezzar. Um, and as we saw, following history now, looking back, that the other parts, the silver and the bronze and the iron, were likely the successive kingdoms that came after um, Babylon, which we know to be Medo-Persia, then Greek, then Rome. And then last week we saw in chapter 7 the four beasts, which also have a similarity to those same kingdoms. We saw how the, the lion with the wings um, had some similarities in correlation to, the, to um, Nebuchadnezzar and what his kingdom was like. And then the, the subsequent animals of the bear and then the leopard um, show, we'll see today, some parallels as well to then the Medo-Persia and the Greek kingdoms. The fourth beast, however, was quite different. And while it may have implied Rome, seemed to speak of some kingdom even greater than Rome. So I'm saying that to see that there is definitely some sort of continuity between these visions. It's almost as if, though, with each vision, we get a bit more detail. Because what are we told here? In fact, we're told specifically here, although we only now see two animals or two pictures, um, two kingdoms, a, a ram and a goat, yet what are we told by the angel Gabriel? What are we told about who the ram is and who the goat is? Are we told specifically who they are or not? Yes, we are. We're told the ram is Medo-Persian kingdom, which came after Babylon, which we read about in Daniel 6 and the lion's den, where Daniel was sent to the lions under King Darius of Medo-Persia. And then later, King Cyrus um, would, would reign as well over um, Medo-Persia. And then we know that historically, after the Persian kingdom came the Greek kingdom. Um, so, so there definitely is some continuity and some parallel. Not altogether exact, but it's there. Are you with me so far? You need to understand that. Now we are described, this um, ram is described as having two horns, which again in and of itself is an appropriate description of the next kingdom, the Medo-Persia, each horn representing one half of this kingdom, half Medo, Medo kingdom and half Persian kingdom. But the one horn is greater than the other because we know the, the, Mer, the Persian part of this coalition was greater. And so that's the ram. And, and the Persian kingdom was very successful as this ram is described here, going westward and northward and southward and, and, and taking over um, and extending its empire successfully and becoming great, which is what the Medo-Persian kingdom did achieve. Um, in any case, we are told that that's what the ram represents. And then we are told about this male goat who, who comes along. Um, this male goat, which then represents the kingdom of Greece, but has one conspicuous horn. Now, who was the main guy who 
um, extended um, and, and caused the Greek Empire to, to rise to power. What is his name? Alexander the Great. And that's who this is speaking of. And we know that that's exactly, in fact, how Alexander the Great worked. He was probably the most successful conqueror of all time. Within just over three years, conquered the entire um, 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 ancient Near Eastern world, the, pretty much the known world at the time. And so that's how he is pictured here. This, this goat runs and, and smashes the ram, um, and then he, he, he runs across the, the, the earth without even touching the ground. It's a picture of what actually happened. Historically, he so swiftly and so effectively conquered the world. That's what Alexander the Great did. He was a highly effective and gifted warrior and war strategician. But what happened to Alexander? He died at a very young age. The horn, as we are told, was broken. He died before his time at age 33, or thereabouts. And what happened historically after he died? There were a couple of men who contested for position number one, but, but nothing ever came of that. And yes, as is described about this goat, four other um, um, empires arose out of this one Greek empire that had got divided into four, led by four different generals. And that historically is verifiable, just as the goat is pictured here as going from one horn to four horns. Um, some, the one ruling the north, the south, the east, and the west of the empire that Alexander has established. So it's incredible. Do you see how incredible this is? That here, centuries before it actually happened, Daniel is given this vision where God is clearly prophesying, predicting what would happen historically. And even with such incredible detail and accuracy. That's why many critics say that this book of Daniel was only written after the event, sometime in the late 1st century um, B.C. or 2nd century B.C., rather than around mid, um, uh, the, the mid, mid 6th century B.C., because they can't believe that it can be so accurate. But it is. This is God. It's God's world. He's king. He's king of kings. And so he determines the future. He holds it in his hands. And so this is accurate. Um, and so, so Daniel gets his vision of these Kingdoms coming, um, although they are described in less flattering ways as they were previously as beasts, as lions and bears, now they are rams and goats. Um, but I guess we do know something about rams and goats, that they tend to be very stubborn and very hard-headed. They literally like butting heads. I mean, ram says it all, right? So, so maybe it's a picture of just the pride and the arrogance that will characterize these kingdoms and their kings, which it does, and how often that own, their own pride is often then the cause of their own downfall. And so Daniel has this vision. But then the, the vision continues with one last section, where within one of these four kingdoms, one of these four um, dynasties that come out of Alexander's Greek kingdom, one of, out of one of these horns comes another little horn. Likely picturing a, another leader um, who, who in and of himself is, again, particularly powerful and particularly destructive. And that it seems to be that this leader, this little horn represented here, is the one who will cause great devastation to God's people and to the temple and to Jerusalem. Now again, we know from history events that happened that would verify this, that there was one of the leaders in the second century BC that came out of the Seleucid kingdom, the Seleucid part of the divided Greek empire that had more the north, a man by the name of Antiochus, 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 however you want to pronounce it, the fourth otherwise known as Antiochus Epiphanes. And that he was dead set on moving south, where um, the promised land in, in Jerusalem was, to take over more of the south and, and Egypt further down. And so God's people now back in Israel, in about back in the promised land, um, 
around the time of um, the, um, between 400 and, and, and 0 AD, um, were in the midst of all this battle between these um, divided Greek empire. But, but in the 2nd century BC, this particular leader came up, and he was intent on Hellenizing, in other words, making all the subjects in his kingdom take on Greek culture and Greek practice. And in particular, he therefore wanted to um, de, um, what's the word? I can't think of it now. But deconstruct, if you like, the Jews' religion. And so he was intense on stopping their sacrifices, on stopping their Sabbath keeping, on stopping the circumcision of babies, on destroying their law. And so those are the things he did. In fact, there was an event that happened where he became so arrogant and so pompous and his hatred for God's people became so focused when he erected a, a statue of his God Zeus in God's temple and sacrificed sacrifices to his God gods on the altar, even sacrificing a pig, a swine, on the altar. It was an abomination. And that is something of what verses 9 to 14 speak about. And that historically is what happened in AD 167, December. And as a result of this event, a group of Jews with others called the Maccabeans um, revolted against Antiochus. And there was a great war and many of God's people were killed. And it took them three years, plus minus, until under Judas Maccabean, they were able to restore the temple and restore sacrifice and restore their worship to a measure three years later. And so verses 9 to 14 cover that dreadful period in history, this worst of incidents where God's people and God's place was massacred. And so again, it is incredible that we have these events for us predicted centuries before, describing what would come for God's people. And so what does this mean for us as we consider what has already now happened by and large and the implications for us as we live day to day? Well, three things as we prepare in this world to be living for the worst. Firstly, worldly powers are fierce but fleeting. We must remember that. Here we have this goat, I mean, this ram that came up that before whom no one could stand and no one could be rescued from his power. He seemed invincible. He this ram would do as he pleased and became great. Then suddenly this male goat came, came along and just crushed this ram. Kicked him out the park, as it were. And then this male goat comes along with this conspicuous horn that is so swift and so effective, but yet short-lived, and the horn is broken. You see, worldly powers indeed are there, and they indeed are fierce, but they are fleeting. They will come and they will go, no matter how great and awesome and unstoppable they may seem. Psalm 2 provides such helpful perspective for us. We read in Psalm 2, verses 1 to 3, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and His anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. I mean, that's it. David there is describing what is the fact of the matter. And this is now 3,000 years ago from us today. But 3,000 years ago, the nations, excuse me, were raging against God. And they still are. 
And so leaders are going to rise. These are going to rise marked by arrogance and, and marked by tyranny. Even seeing themselves as God, as some of these leaders here are pictured in their greatness and in their idolatry. Interesting, epiphany actually means God manifest. And so Antiochus IV had this high view of himself. He even saw himself as equal with the prince of princes. He saw himself as God. And so they are fierce, they are effective, but they don't last. It's wonderful how the psalmist continues in Psalm 2 where he says, and so with all of this raging going on, with all this warring, with all these nations against God, all this running around on earth, but he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. He speaks to them in his wrath and terrifies them in his fury, saying, As for me, I've set my king on Zion, my holy hill. He will break them with a rod of iron, and he will dash them to pieces like pottery. I mean, that's what we are told here about this goat and the kingdoms that come from it, this Greek empire, how um, even though he shall rise up against the prince of princes, he shall be broken, but by no human hand. There it is. God allows worldly evil kingdoms to rise, but he equally so brings them down. And so their reign and terror will always be limited. That's the number, what it's referring to, the 2,300 evenings and morning. It's going to happen. It'll be for a definite time, but it'll be for a limited time and not forever. In the aftermath of World War II, and Hitler and Germany's genocide of Jews and others. The Nuremberg trials of 1946 sentenced many of their surviving leaders to death. I mean, just think of what you know of the Holocaust and those atrocities and the power and the evil that was committed by Hitler and the Nazis, right? But the surviving leaders were sentenced to death at the Nuremberg trials. And one writer recounts this. So after the execution of these Nazi celebrities on the 16th of October, 1947, 1946, 14 bodies, including those of Göring, Ribbentrop, Kittel, Rosenberg, Frank, Steicher, Jodl, and Seis Inquat, were delivered to a Munich crematorium. That same evening, a container holding the amassed ashes of these men was then driven through the rain into the Baravian countryside. After an hour's drive, the vehicle stopped and the ashes were poured into a muddy ditch. Five or six years before, these men could dominate and intimidate. intimidate. But that night, their remains were washed away by the drizzling rain. You see, while evil may have its day, and it will have its day again and again, God, nonetheless, will always have the final say. While evil may have its day, God will always have the final say. And so let's not let raging nations or rebellious politicians or even Friday Silver Ramaphosa signing unconstitutionally and despite so much opposition, the bellable, let this not suffocate our faith. Evil will have its day. A country may get worse, but God will always have the final say. Let's not forget, as we seek to live in this world prepared for the worst, that worldly powers are real and they are fierce, but they're always fleeting. Secondly, in the midst of this kind of life, we need discipleship. 
that is continuous and vigorous. That we need to be growing and equipping ourselves as Christians every day to live in light of this hostile world. It's not going to be easy. There's no fine print in the Bible about the Christian life. We need to be exercising our spiritual muscles, strengthening our faith, serving, being discipled and discipling others, helping ourselves and helping others to persevere. There's, there's no time to rest on our laurels in this Christian life. You see, God is, God is forewarning them, forewarning Daniel and his people through this vision to be sealed up because it wasn't going to take place in Daniel's lifetime. It'll only take place in a couple of centuries' time. But it was to prepare God's people as they would have read through it and read through it that days of evil were coming, that they need to be prepared for that and not be overly surprised by that. And so God forewarns us like he's doing Daniel and his people in this vision in order to forearm us, to prepare us, to keep us vigilant, to keep us watchful, to, to keep us on our toes. In fact, this, this shocking news, this, this bad news, this worst of news about the, the desolation of God's people and, and Jerusalem and the temple is a gift of mercy. We all, I'm sure, have, particularly if you've had kids or maybe even you do it as husband and wife, you try and give each other frights. You know, you hide behind the door and your husband or the dad comes walking down and you jump out and say, boo, and you try and see if you can give the person a fright. And I mean, you've all felt that, right? It's, it is terrifying. Um, the kids have got me a number of times already, although I think I've gotten them more. But imagine I uh, see one of my kids at the corner of my eye, going down the passages and quickly ducking behind the door, and I can see what they're trying to do. I've got two options, right? Um, I can walk down the passage as I was always going to do, and then allow them to jump out and give me the fright and pretend, oh, that was scary, you know, and still give them pleasure. Or I can be the mean daddy and walk down the passage, and as I'm about to come to that room, I jump in and give them a fright and shout boo and give myself the pleasure. <laughs> but the point is, if you know that there's something scary around the corner, even when it comes, you are far better prepared, right? You get less of a fright. And so that's what God is warning us and helping us to do here, to be better prepared. So when the days of evil come, and, the, and come they will, we will not be shaken and our faith will not waver. I mean, Jesus said to his disciples in John 16, I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away, but they will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering even a service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I've said these things to you that, that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. We need to be prepared. We need to be, be growing in God's word and among his people. As we heard earlier today, we need to be fighting the good fight of faith. We must be sure that our discipleship is continuous and vigorous. We've got no excuse for not being forearmed before we have been forearmed. I mean, for, forewarned. Our different circumstances must never change our faith. Never change our, our view of God. Because we know He is in control. And He has said as much that the days are evil. So the worldly powers are fierce but fleeting. Our discipleship needs to be continuous and vigorous. That in and through all of that, our hope remains steadfast and certain because of God. You see, God is clearly shown to be the one in this vision who is king, who is sovereign, in forewarning and predicting the future as it would happen, to give Daniel and his people then and later some encouragement and some hope in the midst of the trials that they would face. And what a great trial and what a great devastation it would be. Daniel did not expect, as I mentioned earlier, things to get worse. And, and maybe you don't expect that things in your life will get worse. 
Um, yes, we pray that things will get better in our country. We pray that things will be better in certain ways, that we will see redemption happen more, that we'll see the gospel go out, we'll see more churches planted. And yes, God's kingdom will prevail, but we do not know God's timetable, and we do not know how he may or may not use evil nations to, to punish his people even, to bring persecution, to bring hardship in order to purify his people, as he's done in the past, as he did with the people of Israel, sending them in exile, allowing the temple to be desecrated. The God will use all sorts of means, either as providence for our lives or in judgment on our nation and on ourselves. But God still cares, and God will never allow his people to finally perish and the wicked to finally win. As I've said, God is, is in control and, and He is in charge. Nothing gets past Him that He hasn't already planned and determined. And so let's not be surprised that, that things may get worse. And especially as we consider our, our great Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, whose whole life was lived being prepared for the worst. That, that he was born to die, as we know. And his whole life, his whole ministry was set towards the cross. He set his face like a flint towards Jerusalem. Nothing and no one would distract him. His whole life was preparing for his death. And he was able to do so, we are told in the book of Hebrews, because of the joy that was set before him. Because of his new, his, his hope ultimately in God. He knew of, although the worst is here, the best was yet to come because of that. And even through that, even through the worst of his death, the Son of God slain for the sin of man, what could be more horrific? What could be more sacrilegious? What could be more devastating? Even as the disciples and his followers felt, huddled in the upper, upper room after his crucifixion and burial, feeling all is lost, feeling hope is gone. But he rose from the dead and is victorious. And if that worst of evils was overcome, by our Lord Jesus Christ, we can be certain that our hope in God is well placed, for He will overcome all evil for us ultimately, because Jesus has done that. He's blazed the trail for us, you see. He's gone into heaven ahead of us. He's opened the door for us. And the amazing thing is, is when Jesus was entering Jerusalem, you know that there was desolation again happening in the temple. And Jesus, in anger, went in with a whip and turned over the tables and chased out the animals. God's own people could never get worship right. And so Jesus came to cleanse and end that temple and to end the worship there. Even as he said to that Samaritan woman at the well that it is no longer about worshiping your God on this mountain and and, 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 and the Jews on that mountain. No, that the worshippers that the Father now seeks are those who worship Him in spirit and in truth. And so now, because of Jesus, we are able to worship God wherever, whenever. That we worship Him today in spirit and in truth. So we're no longer limited geographically in our worship for God. That they can take away this building They can stop our worship in this formal sense, as many Christians over the centuries have experienced. They can even take away our Bibles if they want. But because of what Jesus Christ has done, we know that our worship before God, that even if we can't do any of, all, any of those things, our relationship and our worship and our standing before God remains unchanged. 
Because we no longer worship God based on our performance and our rituals and what we need to do in terms of offering sacrifices. For Jesus has come as the once for all sacrifice. And so we can freely worship Him in spirit and in truth. And that surely is our great hope. That the final word is not to be had by the ram or by the goat. But the final word has been had by the Lamb who died and who rose again and who has assured us that we will be with God forever one day. Oh, they may take our bodies, but they can never touch our souls. For we are people of God and His reign in his kingdom, is never up for grabs. Let us pray. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the confidence we can have to live for you in these difficult days. Days may get met better, but may very well get worse. That we have much hope and much to hold on to. We thank you for the sure confidence that is ours. Help us to remain steadfast. Help us to trust you. Help us to look to keep our eyes on Jesus who has gone before us. Let us be prepared for for what may come. Let us not shrink back. Let us remain faithful, O God. Let us trust you. Let us thank you for the gospel that has given us security in Christ. That we truly are now yours forever worshiping you in spirit and in truth. Thank you for this hope. Thank you for this assurance, O God. Keep us steadfast. Keep us persevering. Keep us standing, O God. Even those this morning here who may be weak, who may be faltering, who who may be slipping and sliding, who may be falling. Oh, won't you, as the servant of the Lord, as Isaiah prophesied, a bruised reed you will not break, smoldering wick you will not snuff out. Strengthen and restore them. They may remain steadfast for you in these days, until you come and we live with you forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.